Hungry Wolf. Uh, being here, I kind of feel like an uh, elder because way back I um, wrote a book about Native women. And my Native, st my story came out of being around my old people and them sharing stories and them understanding that our future generations need to hear these stories. <coughs> In my research, all the research that I've done, I um, came across an old wax recording of one of our great chiefs. His name is Mountain Chief. And when he was singing his war song on this wax tape, he said, the reason I'm singing this song is so that my grandchildren and their children and their children will be able to hear me. So it was very important for our people to pass that knowledge on. Um, um, I, um, I've written about my people. I've told stories about my people. And only because I was looking for myself. I was looking for myself because I went to boarding school and somewhere in that building my spirit lingers. And I've never had a chance to bring myself out. So I do it through my writings. My writings and the work that I've done with my elders has really given me back myself. I, um, I, uh, had, I wasn't beaten at boarding school, but I had some pretty, uh, earth-shaking experiences. And one of the worst ones was being told that my, my grandparents were going to go to hell and that they were um, that they were going to because of their involvement in the Sundance. And I used to look at my grandparents, and they were beautiful people. When my grandfather made incense at night, he would take all his best words out to pray for the protection of his family, his children. And I wondered, how come these people, they don't even know my grandpa, and they're telling me that my grandpa was going to go to hell. And so when I was 14, I decided not to be a Catholic anymore. Because the people that we were entrusted with we're talking, teaching us no fornication between before <laughs> marriage. And guess who was grabbing us? The same people. Every chance they got, they were groping us. We had to fight them off all the time. And yet every day they were saying, oh, you mustn't fornicate before you get married. You, you know, that's really awful stuff. And in my little girl's mind, I was wondering, how come these people act that way? And Because I never experienced it at home. I was the prime candidate for my grandfather to molest me. He was my step-grandfather. But I would lay by that old man. He'd, he'd be laying there. He'd use the wall as a drum and he'd be singing holy songs, my grandpa, and I'd be hugging him. I was 13 years old when I was told that he wasn't my real grandpa. When he died, I was told, he's not your real grandpa. He's... But I always thought of that old man and the love and the kindness that he gave to and then my other grandparents were all involved in the Sundance. And, 
you know, like I go up to the Sundance and I'd feel compelled to confess. But when I was 14, all that changed. And I, I told my dad, I'm gonna find a new religion. He said, my girl, religion is like a wheel. All the hub, all the, the hub is God and all the spokes are the different religion. Go find one you're gonna be comfortable with because your spirituality is telling you that you need another group of people to pray with. So I found my own native religion after some time of searching. And I, uh, for my healing, I had to go back to that. <coughs> and uh, it was the tension that I felt was from my own people. My my peers told me, wow, well, Beverly, you can't bring back the 1800s because I used to wear moccasins all the time and I'd wear long dresses. In my old age, I'd become modern and, and I'd dress the way I dress today. But when I was young, I wore <coughs> nothing but moccasins and long dresses. And, um, and today, what I see is is very different. The people that were making fun of me are the big Indians now. Me, I stay in the background. <laughs> I stay in the background, and I uh, I observe and I write about them. <laughs> I, uh, I was told, you know, how come you use this picture in this uh, book? And I tell them, did you see a, anybody holding a gun to that old Indian? Nobody held a gun to their heads and told them, oh, you have to go get your picture taken. The reason my elders had those pictures taken was because they wanted their grandchildren and their children to see. This is the most common story I've heard, and yet, these pan-Indians are saying, oh, you can't put this in there, and you can't put that in there. And no, I can put, these are my stories. They didn't happen to anybody else, they happened to me. And therefore, they're mine. And I can share them the way that I want to. I, um, I studied with an old flathead woman <laughs> in in Arlene, Montana. She taught me how to pan eyes. And in the process, um, one of her other students that she was really close to, uh, because she wasn't native, but she was practically raised as a native person, this white girl, the elders of the Flathead Nation took her in. And uh, her father was, um, a curator at Glencoe Museum, his name was uh, Vern Dusenberry, and Vern Dusenberry was one of these non-native people <coughs> that so believed in their ways that he went out and started Indian clubs. Mm -hmm. Missoula has a big Indian club, Vern Dusenberry started it. Bozeman University has a big Indian club, Vern Dusenberry started it. And, um, he was very instrumental in, but this old lady, she told, um, she told Lynn, when I talk to you and I share my stories with you, they're your stories, they're your experience. Nobody can come along and tell you, hey, you, how come you're writing about Indians? Well, the reason you're writing about Indians is because you sat down and studied. I never had no intentions of becoming a writer. You know, I wanted to be a nurse. And the best modern dance, jazz dancer. <laughs> <laughs> but I would never dance around the pole. <laughs> I felt in my writing.
writing, I don't let it bother me in my old age because after you you become so old, if anybody talks to you, you just yeah. <laughs> <laughs> because I feel so strong in what I've done. I can go anywhere. I don't need nobody's approval anymore. And on top of that, I had a grandfather that stressed to me all the time, women are holy. You're, you're the givers of life. So my girl, you're so special. You're a holy person. And so all these teachings that I got from them, you know, they're my teachings. I can't, you know, I'll share what I, I can with you, but nobody can come to me and tell me, hey, how dare you put my grandmother's picture? Well, if you didn't want your grandmother's picture in there, then don't take her picture. You know, when she had that picture, you, were, you, were, you weren't even a twinkle in your dad's eye. <laughs> so, you know, your grandmother chose to have her picture taken for a reason, and nobody held a gun to her head to get her picture taken. Our societies have had pictures taken of them. And the people, some of those old people I was around, and I asked them, you know, how come they said, well, our grandkids need to see us. You know, this is our way <laughs> to allow our grandkids to have some contact with us. I'm never going to see my great-great-grandchildren, but I have a means for them to see me. If I can get my voice recorded, I'll leave messages for them. So a lot of our old people have recordings that they keep in safe places. When they want to hear their relatives, they go back and listen to them. And if they want to share some of those stories, well, it's up to them. My informants, some of my informants came directly to my home and asked me, we did a, a book with the late Ben Caffro from Sixaga, and Ben Caffro came after us for about two years before we could make time for this old man so we could write his stories. And when we, when we did that, we sat for three weeks straight, every day, from nine o'clock in the morning with a break for lunch, and then evening time would say, well, you know, this is enough, because he just told us story after story after story, and us, you know, you get this overload, and, well, I can tell you another story. Do you have time? Well, let's eat supper first. <laughs> uh, so, in my doing this work, it wasn't just getting the stories from the old people, but I was their hands and feet. When I went to my grandmother's, for the ways of my grandmother's, it was like I, I told them what I was doing, and they were all enthused, but I'd go to my, my grandmother's, <coughs> and first I'd hear about their ailments, and then I'd hear about their wicked son-in-laws, <laughs> and then maybe in between, so the way that I was able to get those stories was to go and just, I'd say, on such and such a day, I'm going to come and clean your house. So I'd go there and <coughs> wash their walls and they'd sit here, you're working too hard, my girl, sit here. And I'll t I will visit and then I'd hear about their ailments, their son-in-laws, and then the start telling stories. You know. Sometimes I'd, I'd throw in a word and that would trigger something and they'd start telling me these great big long stories and I wouldn't have to wash the walls anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but I never felt any tension from my old people. It's the young modern people and I understand because everything's been written about. Everything's in museums. Sometimes they get very angry. Well, I don't have to win. So that you can understand. So that you can take those words and say, oh, now I understand. Now I really got it. 
And if they want to learn further, then you go to the source. You go to the source and they, you learn about ceremonies, you learn about that, but you're not going to learn that from my book. So, that's all I have to say. Did right. I say enough? Oh, yeah. <laughs>